welcome to the Scottish Greens podcast. I'm Lorna Slater, one of the party co-leaders. And I'm Patrick Harvey. I'm the other one. <laughs> uh, it's been a while since we did a co-leader broadcast, uh, or co-leader podcast, I should say. We had a, a co-leader broadcast on Friday, which we were doing live, but unfortunately due to the event that happened in Glasgow, the very sad incident in Glasgow on Friday afternoon, we had to cut that short. Yeah, it was very, very distressing incident for the whole of Glasgow, for the whole of, of Scotland, I think. Uh, the news just started to filter through in the in the few minutes before we, we went live on the on the Green Live platform. And as we were continuing the discussion, it became clear that this was a, a very serious and tragic incident. So, um, yeah, it didn't feel appropriate at that point to, to continue the discussion. But the whole thing has raised so many huge issues for our society. Uh, not just for, for Glasgow and how asylum seekers uh, are being treated in Glasgow, but uh, how the whole UK's asylum system works as well. Um, and I, So I thought this might be a good opportunity to talk a little bit more about that, because I think given how things are represented in the papers, using phrases like illegal immigrant for asylum seekers, it is not illegal to seek asylum. Um, people you know, there's a lot of anti-asylum seeker rhetoric around people coming here to take advantage or yeah. when actually people are escaping some of the worst conditions on planet Earth and we should be offering um, support uh, to people who have sort of made it this far. Absolutely. And, you know, we obviously have to, to preface this by saying we still don't know all of the, the details about what happened last week and there'll be continued investigations uh, and we obviously, uh, you know, want to express our, our very best wishes for those who are currently recovering in hospital and for everybody else who's been affected. But what we do know is that there's a, a, a population of asylum seekers in, in Glasgow uh, who were moved with pretty much zero notice out of their accommodation, uh, which, you know, is hardly lavish, you know, really, really basic accommodation that they were in. But they were moved with zero notice into hotels at the beginning of lockdown. And ostensibly, the reason for that was to reduce the amount of travelling around the city, either by themselves uh, or by the, um, the the people providing services to them. But they've been effectively left uh, in wildly inadequate conditions for months now. And inevitably, that's been a distressing and a stressful situation for people who were already suffering severe physical and uh, my mental health uh, stresses that... Uh, that I think most of us in our daily lives can barely imagine. And I think it's something that maybe isn't commonly known of what the conditions for an asylum seeker are in the UK. So asylum, you can seek asylum in the UK or any country that accepts that sort of application on the basis that your life is in danger in the country that you came from. And But while you're waiting for your application to be processed, which can take years, absolutely, there's severe restrictions on what you can do as an asylum seeker. You cannot, for example, seek work. You can't get employment. So you have no way to get money. You also don't have recourse to public funds. So that's things like universal credit, all the kind of social safety net that we have for people who live in the UK. So by definition, the system makes you destitute. And then as is in the case in Glasgow, puts you at the mercy of these private corporations who are responsible for your welfare and upkeep, essentially. But these are profit-making companies. So people who have no incentive really to look after you because they're a profit-making company have every single bit of power, every single bit of food, your, your clothing, your top-ups for your mobile phone, everything that you need to function comes through this profit-making structure and the abuses in it are rife. Well, certainly, you know, uh, what used to be uh, provided as a, as a public service has for many years now been outsourced. Uh, in Glasgow, uh, up until recently, it was CERCO. Now it's a, a, an organisation called the Mears Group, uh, which, yeah, is not uh, like a, 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 a third sector social housing provider. It's not like a housing association. It's a, it's a profit-driven company which runs a huge number of, of housing services, uh, not just for asylum seekers, but for many, many people uh, in uh, in other situations down south, a uh, range of other services that they provide in social care and so on. Uh, but they've now been given the contract by the Home Office to provide uh, this kind of initial and dispersed accommodation in Glasgow. So the system keeps you destitute, doesn't give you any option to work your way out of a system and puts you at the mercy of someone whose job it is to make money from your suffering. It's, it's 
a kind of an unbelievable situation that we put people in when really they're just trying to find a place to live, to raise their kids, to join our community. And we create yeah. these kind of barriers around that. I well, think yeah. it's horrendous. Yeah, destitution is the is the phrase that we normally uh, use uh, in, in relation to people who've reached the end of the asylum system and they don't get access to even that basic level of accommodation. They don't get access to any kind of uh, income at all. Uh, and they're not able to access publicly funded services either. So that no recourse to public funds uh, is set, essentially is, is about a, a cohort of people who are dumped at the end of the system. They're not going to be deported. Uh, many of them come from unsafe countries where it's illegal to deport them to, uh, but they're just uh, excluded from the system. They've become, uh, in some senses, non-people. Uh, and I think most people in Scotland would be horrified mm. if they genuinely saw and understood the impact that that's, uh, that's, that's having on people's lives. How did we come to have such a cruel and inhuman system? Well, I mean, the, it's probably too simplistic to, to nail it down to one single reason, but certainly for all of my lifetime, uh, we've had government after government in the UK of any political complexion, uh, which has just kept nudging things a little bit more toward uh, the interests of, of the far right and racist ideology uh, in the in the hope of defeating it, and it's a it's a it's a hiding to nothing really, because you're never going to defeat that kind of racist xenophobic ideology uh, by leaning into it. It has to be opposed. It has to be challenged. Uh, and although there are a great many people uh, who want a more humane system and recognise uh, asylum seekers, refugees, as well as uh, other immigrants who are not part of the asylum system, they recognise them as human beings. Uh, government after government. Have just made the system that a little bit more hostile, a little bit more hostile, a little bit more hostile, and we end up with something that's that's profoundly brutal. Because I remember uh, when we had Theresa May as Prime Minister, and she gave that speech about citizens of nowhere, and I found that for myself as an immigrant, profoundly sort of offensive that I was a citizen of nowhere. Yeah. I've paid all my adult taxes in this country. I volunteer in my community. I. I participate fully in society and yet she considers me a citizen of nowhere as if I have no value. And I am a highly privileged immigrant, you know, white English speaking, university educated immigrant. And, you know, if she considers me of no value, what about, you know, what does she consider everybody, everybody else who doesn't fit those privileged categories? It's just a way of sort of dehumanizing us. Absolutely. De dehumanizing is, is the word. You know, most people have a natural empathy for, for others around us, you know. Uh, and it takes a lot to, to, to try and knock that, that natural empathy out of people. Uh, you know, we've had decades of relentless, hostile, anti-immigrant, anti-asylum seeker propaganda in a lot of the mainstream press. Uh, and yet, even still, you know, if you, if you see the kind of responses that uh, organisations like Refugee, who invite people to write welcome letters uh, to, to newly arrived asylum seekers, people have that empathy still. Uh, and I think it's it's profoundly heartening, actually, that uh, even though governments and a lot of the press have done their level best to make people afraid of asylum seekers, there's a great many people who do still recognise them as human beings and want to reach out with empathy and, and with a, a warm welcome. As someone who grew up in a former British colony, I can't tell you how nuts it is for British people and Scottish people to object to immigration. The saying is that there's more Scottish people in Canada than in Scotland because British people emigrated en masse to places around the world. And then as the sort of diaspora comes back, the results of that colonization come back that people all around the world feel a connection with Britain because their countries were colonized by Britain at yeah. some point. As yeah. they come back, suddenly it's like, oh, this is this is like, you hear the consequences of my actions. And people are, are getting really upset that people who like myself, who grew up in a former colony, feel a connection with Britain, want to come back, and then are suddenly made unwelcome. Mm. It's like, well, are we all in this together or not? Yeah, I mean, obviously, migration and movement have been part of the human story uh, since before we were humans. You know, it's, it's always been part of the way that we've lived. Uh, and a lot of people individually will move for completely benign reasons. Uh, but certainly the UK the history is, is one of, of movement around the world for uh, exploitation, extraction, colonization, uh, and uh, yeah, extremely malign reasons. We need to acknowledge that history as well as the present, the, the way that 
uh, UK foreign policy continues to create uh, pressures that, that drive people out of their, their homes, that, that undermine and degrade people's ability to have a, a decent life at home or to be safe at home. And that's one of the reasons why people might be forced to move not by choice, uh, but because they're not safe. So recently I was asked by a journalist, um, what what is the difference between, I guess, what we would call blood and soil nationalism, the kind of nationalism that I feel, for example, led to Brexit, or civic nationalism, which is the kind of nationalism upon which we're trying to base the Scottish independent movement. And I often say that I'm not Scottish. I wasn't born here. I have no Scottish ancestry. I don't speak with a Scottish accent. I, but I would love to be Scottish, as in the day I get a Scottish passport will be a very happy day for me. So for me, civic nationalism is about having a say in the community that you live in and participate in, regardless of how you came to be in that community. I don't know if you have a view on that. Sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of this which isn't really about politics as much as culture and, and people's expectations of of what it is to be part of a community and a society, uh, and and to have an inclusive model uh, of uh, of citizenship, uh, where you know, if you if you're here, if you're working, if you're living, if you're part of our society, if you're uh, you know if you have friendships and relationships in our society, you, you're a member of our society, uh, and you don't necessarily need a piece of paper to to prove that. Uh, there's a lot of people who I think, uh, you know, even supporters of independence who you know, don't feel comfortable with uh, the word nationalism of any kind because they, uh, they, they don't like the idea uh, of a nation state as something exclusive. But there is a really powerful opportunity uh, to create a, a state and a society that is explicitly inclusive, uh, that is open to freedom of movement, that is open to human rights, uh, and that is, is open to saying, uh, you know, in terms of Scotland, if, if anybody uh, is here, you might be a new Scot, but you're still a Scot. There's certainly something perverse about the way nation states are currently set up where under capitalism, where capital, as in money, can move freely and, <laughs> and very wealthy people can move freely around the world without any border checks, without any problems at all. But people, ordinary people cannot. We are limited and constrained by these borders. And it's one of the sort of built in unfairnesses of capitalism is that money can be taken out of your country, disappear off into tax havens, can be resources from your country, can be exploited and wealth from that can be created that doesn't benefit your country at all. But if you want to move to another country to make your life better, no, no, no you can't do that there's rules and boundaries well i think it's uh, i think it's worse even than just capitalism you know the, there are there are people who would describe themselves as as capitalists through and through absolute free marketeers uh, who uh, liked the fact that the uk uh, pushed europe into being more of a of a market structure that that did have this these four pillars of a free market free movement of people of goods of capital uh, and, and of, of, of common regulation and so on. Um, and, you know, th there is, a, there is a, a left as well as a right view in favour of free movement. Uh, but what, is, what there is no case for other than this xenophobic nationalism uh, is the idea that capital is free to move, but people are not. That's just a recipe for ever deeper labour market exploitation ever more inequality, even more so than, than we have now. And that's what a lot of the Brexiteers have in mind. It's worse than just capitalism. It's capitalism on steroids because it's mixed in with this nasty xenophobic brand uh, of, uh, uh, of, of national identity, of exclusive nationalism. So I read an interesting article in The Economist, those radical hippies that they are who write The Economist, <laughs> that was saying that one of the best things that we could do for to boost the global economy, I mean, we're not, ignore the climate crisis for the moment, but you know, like one of the best things, according to The Economist, we could do for the world economy would be to allow increased freedom of movement of people because a person in a developing nation working for a wage who, for example, moved to London and even on a minimum wage or even on a precarious wage would still be earning more money than they would in their home country and would be contributing to the taxation in the UK, would probably be sending money home to their family and in all ways would be boosting the world economy. It, so there seems to be a sort of counterintuitive element where we think, oh, protecting our economy means lifting these borders up and stopping free movement. But in fact, 
it's good for the global economy for people to move. It's good for national economies to move. You know, for example, while we were still part of the EU, we got young, talented, hardworking people from the EU who came to the UK and started families who really helped reinvigorate our aging society. It's, it's very counterintuitive to, to block these things off. Well, it's certainly um, an empty argument to say that, uh, that freedom of movement harms us economically. Um, I think it's, it's also uh, you know, important to acknowledge that even if people uh, are, are free to decide where they want to, to move to, where they want to live, and I would love to, to think that one day we'll live in a, a whole world where everybody in the world uh, has that ability to make a, make a choice in their own lives, there is still absolutely a need, if you want a fairer, more equal and sustainable economy, to make sure that rich countries are not exploiting poorer countries by attracting all of their talented people and, and leaving them without folk to, to run their uh, their economy, their public services, their government, and so on, uh, but also to make sure that uh, you know we 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 do protect uh, labour standards, especially at the at the very bottom end of the pay scale. We don't want uh, this just to be an excuse for uh, vast global companies to shift their investment toward wherever the lowest cost labour is. We want to be raising uh, the, the the standards for everybody, uh, wherever they choose to to live, work, or or make a life. Absolutely. And I've heard some of the Scottish Green Party members, and I actually don't know if this is official policy or not, but talk about abolishing the Home Office. What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, the, the Home Office is uh, an institution which has been used for so long, as I said earlier, by government after government uh, to enforce a fundamentally uh, inhuman system. Uh, so, so, you know, just taking as, asylum as, as one example, the, the asylum system that we have in the UK mm-hmm. is fundamentally designed to say no to the maximum number of people. We should have a, a, an asylum system that's designed to ensure that everyone who needs refuge gets it. Everyone who needs safety gets it. Uh, so, yeah, we would like to get rid of the Home Office and replace it with institutions that are fundamentally designed around what people need. Uh, a, a ministry for, for safe refuge, for example, uh, is one way that you could describe the set of institutions that are genuinely humane society uh, based on people's human rights, based on a, a recognition that, that people uh, do have a not just a right to move, but an ability to contribute and make uh, a, a fair, open and welcoming society uh, a happier place to be. So that alternative set of institutions is what we would be proposing uh, and to, to sweep away uh, a home office which has been fundamentally used to police a racist set of policies for so many decades that it's probably unreformable in its current state. So that seems to me to be not a million miles away from the calls we're hearing in America to defund the police as a as a way of acknowledging that the police, in many cases, cannot be reformed. They're so fundamentally racist to their core and have violence built right into the system that they cannot be reformed and therefore should be abolished in some cases and replaced sure. with something more humane institutions. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's really only in the, in the last, uh, you know, recent period when the, the Black Lives Matter movement has grown so much more uh, mm-hmm. uh, globally recognized that a lot of people in, in countries like this one have come to understand some of the history of, of police forces. There are, there are police forces still existing, still working in some US states, which were founded as slave catcher militia, uh, and which have uh, have had that, that institutional memory generation after generation after generation, and are still profoundly institutionally racist. So yeah, there are, there are strong parallels here. You know, what, what I would be interested though, from, from your perspective, because you, you, as you said earlier, you're a new Scot, you're an immigrant, however you, however you want to describe yourself, um, you've you've come to this country. Do you feel that sense that most people in Scotland do want a different system, do want a more open and welcoming approach to these issues? And, and you know, how, how does the how does the, the the hostile rhetoric impact on you? So I think that on the whole, I live in a very uh, in a bubble. I li- you know I'm a member of the Scottish Greens, which is a very welcoming party, a very mixed party. And I work in, a, in an industry which actually has a lot of EU citizens, mm-hmm. for example, working yeah. in. I think the biggest effect is to make my colleagues feel unwelcome, to make my colleagues start to think about, well, maybe I don't want to raise my kids in Britain. Uh, certainly, I know one colleague, he's actually a Scottish 
person himself took his family to Sweden. He went, nope, I don't want, I don't want my kids mm. in UK anymore. I don't, I don't trust the erosion of standards, you know, food quality standards, environmental standards, quality of life standards that is going to happen under a Tory government. I don't want to live under austerity anymore. I don't want my kids growing up in a system that disadvantages people who go to ordinary schools and privileges people whose parents are rich and go to private schools. Mm. He just didn't want his kids raised in that way. But and thinking about I someone think that's like that who's... Thing. Thinking about someone like that who's not involved in a political party, or, or uh, I don't know if he is or not, but uh, would he notice, would he see the fact that, that attitudes in Scotland are less hostile, uh, even if we don't have control of those powers yet, uh, that, that a lot of people do want a, a more humane system? I certainly hope so. I mean, I, I can see, I see examples of it myself. People say, as you do, oh, well, welcome to Scotland. We consider you Scottish because you live here, which which makes me feel good. I think that's welcoming. I think it's significant that the First Minister has made public announcements about how people are welcome here, that, which is so different from the kind of announcements we see out of Westminster, which are all around keeping people out and making people feel unwelcome. Theresa May's go home vans and all mm. that nonsense. Yeah. So I think... And I think it matters what public figures say. I've also sat on the train and heard people say horrendous racist things and terrible things about immigrants. So I think that it isn't universal in Scotland. I think it's something we still need to talk yeah. about and be be open, um, open about defending immigration and open about being anti-racist. It's not enough to not be racist yourself. Yeah. You have to be anti-racist. But it is reassuring, at least in Scotland, that public figures are willing to stand up and defend immigration, defend yeah. civic nationalism, defend people's rights to be part of the Scottish community, no matter where you came from or how you came to be here. And that is encouraging. No, it is. But you're right that it's something that we do continually need to work on, uh, never rest on a, an assumption uh, that because, you know, statistically, social attitudes are a little bit less hostile here, that that's enough. It's not enough. Um, and yeah, the, the, there is there is racism in our society and in, in our institutions, uh, just as there is in our history. Uh, and the the kind of forces that are trying to actively uh, cultivate and, and build the far right uh, at the moment are active in this country just as they are elsewhere. So we constantly need to be on our guard against, uh, against that uh, and make sure that we're uh, talking openly about these issues in a way that... Uh, that hopefully encourages people to have that empathy, to express that empathy, and to see one another as human beings. And if if replacing the likes of the the Mears Group or Circle before that as these outsourced uh, profit driven companies, and instead providing support that people need uh, as a public service, uh, if that's one way of 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 making that kind of vision a reality, uh, then it's something that I think a lot of people in Scotland would want to to set about that task with enthusiasm. I certainly hope so. And I think another thing we could do is celebrate the achievements and contributions of refugees who have come here. I mean, there's the high profile green Majid Majid, who was mayor of <laughs> Sheffield, was it? And then a, a MEP who's come to speak to us in, in Edinburgh. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's a brilliant speaker, example yeah. of someone who's come, come to Britain as a refugee and then uh, contributed to his community, volunteered his time to try and make the world a better place. One of our candidates, uh, lead candidates for the Scottish elections next year, Nadia Kananji, is also uh, has a background as a refugee coming to Glasgow. So I think the more people we can get in public positions who have that sort of experience, the better chance we have of making these institutions more compassionate. Yeah, and I would say the same thing about the media. You know, the, we should be seeing the, the faces and hearing the voices of all of Scotland. Uh, including people who are, who are new Scots uh, from whatever route they've they've taken to, to come here, because that is our culture. Uh, and our media, I think, has a responsibility to reflect that in a positive light. Uh, and again, to to make sure that we're that we're seeing one another as human beings, as real people. It's been lovely to speak to you today, Patrick. I hope you have a good week. And you and uh, let's uh, let's constantly keep looking out for ways to to turn all that that positive uh, kind of vision and energy into a reality.